This is a diode. It acts as an electrical one-way valve, allowing current to flow in only one direction. We can use a diode to convert AC into DC, simply blocking the negative half of the wave, so all we're left with is positivity. Yay! This is known as a half-wave rectifier, and it's pretty crap, so what we usually do is put four diodes together into a clever arrangement known as a full bridge rectifier. This is the schematic symbol typically used for a full bridge rectifier, and we can see the four diodes. Now, I find this representation a bit confusing and personally prefer to spread it out a little like this. We can clearly see that each connection of the AC input has a pair of diodes, with one facing towards positive DC and the other facing from negative DC. Let's take a quick look at one in action before we delve into their big flaw. To make it a bit easier to see what's going on, I've made this rectifier using a special type of diode, light emitting diodes, or LEDs. The red ones conduct and therefore light up when the AC input is positive, and the blue ones when the AC is negative. Here we can see the rectified output, and it's quite similar to that of the half-wave rectifier, except when the AC input goes negative, our clever arrangement of diodes flips the connection around to make it positive once more. Typically, full bridge rectifiers come in a single package like these, which are typically designed to be cooled as they can get pretty toasty with a lot of current flowing. Diode rectifiers are used basically everywhere we need to convert AC to DC. They seem great, a simple and low cost circuit that does exactly what we need, and indeed for many years that was the case, with full bridge rectifiers being used in everything from smoke alarms to locomotives. But there's always been a problem with the way that these rectifiers turn AC into DC, and it stems from the operation of the diodes. Just as is the case for a mechanical one-way valve, diodes need some pressure, or voltage, to push them open and allow current to flow. This means current will only flow from the AC input when its voltage is higher than the DC output. For basic loads, this isn't a problem. For example, here I have a simple 12 volt lamp, and we can see the current drawn on the AC side of the rectifier is fairly smooth and sinusoidal. This is because the lamp isn't storing any energy, it's just consuming it. So when the AC voltage reduces, the DC voltage follows. The problem comes when you're driving a load that needs a smooth DC voltage, which is almost all modern loads. By far the most common these days are isolated DC to DC converters. This is how pretty much all modern power supplies work, first converting mains AC to DC, and then changing the voltage and adding in some isolation, with a much smaller and more efficient DC to DC converter. Anyway, back to smoothing our output from the rectifier. If you've watched any of my recent videos, you'll know that there's a particular component we can always rely on when we need to smooth voltage, capacitors. Capacitors store charge, meaning when the AC voltage is at its peak, the capacitor will get charged up to that voltage through the rectifier, and then when the AC voltage drops down, the capacitor will stay charged and keep the voltage at that level. Of course, there's only so much energy a capacitor can hold, so the bigger the load, the more that voltage will droop down before getting charged back up again at the next peak of the AC. And it's that part, the charging up of the capacitor, which is where the big problem lies. Because we're only charging up the capacitor at the peaks of the wave, that means all the energy that's going to flow into our DC load until the next time the cap gets charged up needs to be put into the capacitor in one go, a short, sharp pulse of current, which we can see here on the oscilloscope. This very peaky current draw results in poor power factor, which is a measure of how nice a load is from the point of view of the supply, usually the power grid. Power factor is calculated by dividing the real power drawn by a load by its apparent power, which may sound complicated, but I promise it's actually really simple. Apparent power is what we get when we measure the RMS voltage, measure the RMS current, and then multiply the two together, in this case a little over 49 volt amps. Real power is what we get when we multiply the voltage and current waveforms to get a power waveform, and then calculate the average of that. We can do this using the math function of the oscilloscope, the purple waveform is the power, and we can see at the bottom of the screen it's telling us our average, the real power draw, which is about 32 watts. So dividing that by the apparent power shows this circuit has a power factor of about 0.66, where an ideal power factor would be 1. Low power factor is a problem, because it means the RMS current draw of a device is more than it needs to be. For example, if I have a 240 watt laptop charger, and I'm running it from 240 volt mains, then it should draw 1 amp. But if it has a power factor of a half, then it's actually going to draw double that, 2 amps. That puts a lot of unnecessary strain on the grid, as the resistive losses in transformers and transmission lines are proportional to the square of the current, so will be four times higher than they need to be. Because of this, grid operators in many countries have strict requirements on the power factor drawn by large consumers like factories, and for us domestic users, the devices and appliances we buy, 
must conform with local regulations and standards, like IEC 61000-3-2, which dictates limits for harmonic current emissions, essentially the power factor, for anything over 75 watts. So we need a way to clean up this peaky current waveform from our rectifier and make it more sinusoidal, and we can do this with a power factor correction circuit. We can split PFC into two main categories, passive and active. Passive power factor correction just adds a few extra passive components to try and somewhat smooth out the current spikes. In its simplest form, it's just an inductor in series with the rectifier. As inductors slow down changes in current, we can use one here to flatten and widen the current spike and prolong the period of current draw. We can see that while this is certainly an improvement over the bare rectifier, our current draw is still definitely not sinusoidal, and our power factor is only increased to 0.7. Passive power factor correction was more popular in the olden days, before the advent of modern power electronics, in particular the boost converter. My last two videos are all about these DC to DC converters, how they work and how to design them, so give them a watch if you want to know more. Now the reason boost converters are exciting for us is because we can precisely control their input current, irrespective of supply voltage. So all we need to do is hook up a boost converter to the output of our rectifier, and then tell it to draw the perfect amount of current at any given instant, so that we have a sinusoidal current waveform on the AC side of the rectifier. This isn't trivial to implement, but let's give it a go. First off, we need to measure our AC input voltage, so that we can time our current draw correctly. Good power factor isn't just about the shape of the current waveform, it also needs the voltage and current to be perfectly in phase, as even the slightest offset will reduce our power factor below the level required by our regulatory overlords. Now there's quite a few ways to do this, but I'm going to have a go at doing it in the simplest way I can think of, which is just detecting when the AC voltage swaps polarity. I can get away with this because the actual amplitude of the AC supply doesn't matter, as long as we have a sinusoidal current in phase with it. To detect the polarity of the voltage, I've made this circuit using an optically isolated gate driver. When the AC voltage is positive, current will flow through the internal LED of the optocouple, turning the output on. When the voltage goes negative, the LED and the output will turn off. I've added this diode to limit the reverse voltage seen by the LED, as these usually can't block more than a few volts without risking damage. Here you can see the output of the gate driver, which is a simple digital signal synchronised with the grid voltage. Next we need a target current that we can then try to match with our boost converter. For this we can simply apply a sign function to the time that's elapsed, since we detected the AC changing polarity. To keep things simple, I've assumed the grid is at a perfect 50Hz, which is fine for this demonstration but wouldn't be a good idea for a real PFC circuit. To view this waveform, I'm using it to control the duty cycle of a PWM output, which, combined with an RC filter, allows us a sneak peek at the ideal current waveform we want on the scope. As the boost converter is on the output of the rectifier, the current will always be positive, hence why it looks like the output voltage of the rectifier. Finally, we have the hardest part. getting our boost converter to draw that current from the rectifier. To control the current drawn by the boost converter, we need to vary the duty cycle at which we switch its MOSFET, and to have any hope of getting the correct current, we'll need some form of feedback, which means we have to find a way to measure the current. For this, I'm using a Hall Effect Current Probe, which detects the magnetic field around a wire and outputs a voltage proportional to the current. This is what I've been using to show current waveforms throughout the video. This voltage is then sampled by the ADC of the microcontroller many times through the AC cycle, and we can validate this once again by outputting it through PWM. This measured current is compared to the ideal current waveform we're aiming for, and any difference between the two is then compensated for through a PI controller, which will increase the duty cycle if the current's too low, or decrease it if it's too high. Tuning this controller was very challenging, as it needs to be fast enough to accurately recreate our target current, while also remaining unaffected by the noisy switching of the boost converter. In the end, my code was disgusting, and we shall speak of it no more. And here's the final result, a mostly sinusoidal current perfectly in phase with the supply voltage. Isn't it beautiful? However, before the big reveal of the power factor, let's take a moment to appreciate the hard work that the controller is having to do to regulate this current. Here we can see the averaged PWM signal that we are sending to the boost converter, and we can clearly see how the duty cycle is highest when the AC voltage is lowest, which makes sense because we have to boost it to get it up above our DC voltage and get current to flow. We can also see that the duty cycle is always above zero, which means we're always boosting, so our DC voltage is actually higher than it is without power factor correction. This is a really handy side effect of using a boost converter for PFC, 
as it means we can take our laptop charger or TV with us across the pond to Yankee land and simply boost the input more to get the same DC voltage. The controller of the PFC circuit will automatically know it has to draw double the current because the supply voltage is halved, and will also detect that the frequency is 60Hz rather than 50Hz, and synchronise perfectly. How cool is that? Now we've been waiting long enough, let's take a look at the power factor of this boost PFC circuit. We've got 15.4 volts, 3.14 amps, and 47.4 watts, giving us a power factor of 0.98. Wow! Now, before we wrap up, I just want to take a quick look at some more advanced active power factor correction circuits, all based on the same boost converter principle, but with the goal of reducing component count and improving efficiency. First of all, we have bridgeless PFC, which basically just swaps the rectifier for a pair of boost converters, with one operating on the positive half cycle and the other on the negative. While this does increase complexity a bit, there can be a decent efficiency improvement and the distortion that occurs at the zero crossing of the AC can be reduced. Next is totem pole PFC, which essentially just swaps one of the pair of diodes in the rectifier with a synchronous boost converter like this. Again, this can bring efficiency improvements and also reduces component count, which is always a good thing. Both of these can be further improved by swapping their remaining diodes with MOSFETs or other active switches, which have lower conduction losses than diodes. Doing this makes the two circuits the same, an active full bridge with a series inductor to the grid. This is pretty much an ideal AC to DC converter, with a controllable output voltage, sinusoidal input current, it can even run in reverse to send nice clean power back into the grid. So that's PFC, power factor correction, undoubtedly one of the most important circuits of the 21st century, and an absolute must have on our path towards a sustainable future. I hope this video's got you as excited as I got making it, and on that strange thought, it's time to end. Bye-bye.